discussion now of this very nice conference. It's Larry Schulman, and again, Momentum appears in the title now. Momentum, yeah, yeah. yeah. Please. Okay, this is not, um, I think I'm a little too close. The uh, topic is not quite uh, semi-classical, but I think a lot of people have worried about these questions, and I'm hoping that there'll be some interest in the audience. The uh, question is, what is the relative momentum for identical particles? And uh, I'll describe them, then I'll uh, derive the derivative of relative momentum, then I'll give a second derivative, uh, a derivation, and the two derivations will agree, even though one is conventional, one is not so conventional. And finally, I'll talk about problems and possible solutions, and I'll talk about conclusions. Okay. The, uh, now, Many times a day, in the, uh, it's at CERN, for example, there will be two separated detectors, A and B, let's call them. And uh, from each detector, you can determine that it's, uh, let's say, an electron, or maybe it's a hadron, but the two are identical. And that the, um, you can measure its momentum. So you have PI minus P, PA minus PB. That's a quantity that you're measuring. At the same time, so you know PA and PB, maybe there's some uncertainty because of the size of the detector. That's another story, but presumably you know PA and PB. Now, you can know from PA and PB, you can uh, deduce the values of PA plus PB squared, PA minus PB quantity squared, but what you're unable to say is what is PA minus PB, as, as you'll see in a moment. And uh, the purpose of this talk is to look for an operator that corresponds to that because there's definite information. Uh, it's not PA1 minus P2 where you're assigning random numbers to the, uh, to the particles. And it's not P2 minus P1, uh, but it is useful information. You, you learn something from PA minus PB. In particular, you learn a point on the projective plane. You learn the direction. The direction might be this way, it might be that way, but it's a certain line on the projection pla projective plane, which is really the projective sphere, and uh, you can know that. And the question is, uh, what is the mathematical object associated with this information? And we'll see that it's, uh, now, there's a few items to make a discussion over. Uh, P1 minus P2, both of them, if you s put them between even states or odd states, you have your choice, you get zero. So P1 minus P2 is not a, a candidate for this thing. Uh, now you have a number of questions that come up. Uh, the first question is, as I said, can the von Neumann postulate that every observable is a self-adjoint operator cover this? And the answer will be no, unfortunately. And uh, that leaves us with a problem. Uh, a second problem is, why has no one looked at this for, I think it's 90 years, or maybe since Pauli's principle was enunciated? Maybe since Gibbs uh, first <laughs> talked about identical particles. No one is worried about this. Gavot and I uh, searched the literature. We could find nothing that dealt with uh, P1 minus P2. In fact, just as a comment, the um, P1, the, everything that people calculate are even functions. All, all the energies and, the, the, uh, and so forth, the, the uh, relative velocities, those are all even functions. And even functions are OK. But odd functions, uh, well, oh, I, I said it, yeah. So even, even functions can be uh, uh, accommodated, but odd functions, uh, you can't even express them in quantum field theory. And uh, so what is P1 or PA minus PB? That becomes the question. Because there is information, it's a relative distance, or the relative uh, uh, position between them. It's not, it's not given by this direction or that direction, but it is a direction. On the, uh, on the projective sphere. Okay, uh, now, um, okay, we'll find that von Neumann's ideas don't work. And uh, uh, now, von Neumann's ideas don't work in a number of cases. It's not that this is uh, original or unique, but all those cases can be avoided, as I'll now explain. First of all, there's a famous theorem of Pauli that precludes self-adjoint operator representing time. By the way, I heard that, uh, I missed this yesterday, I was ill, 
that uh, there was a nice talk by Parisi, who's probably here, yeah, about uh, an alternate view of uh, Neumann's theorem. There's also uh, POVMs, uh, probability obser uh, observable uh, value measures, which is another way to deal with this. But as far as an operator is concerned, uh, von Neumann, well, if you, have a, if you have an operator, good. And if you don't, uh, you can take von Neumann's uh, characterization of time as a parameter, and therefore it's not important to define it as, uh, as a self-adjoint operator. A second example of something that's uh, not a self-adjoint operator is a coordinate for having, if you have a hard wall, then the momentum along the di one direction from the hard wall is not, uh, uh, is not an observable, is not self-adjoint. But for that case, you can uh, say, well, a hard wall is an idealization and there's no such thing, and therefore we don't have to worry about it. And finally, you can talk about radial momentum and spherical coordinates. And radial momentum is not self-adjoint. There's a very nice paper by uh, Bonner and other people uh, in, I think it's in American Journal of Physics, which tells you that uh, this is not self-adjoint, that the uh, radial coordinate has problems. It has different defect indices. However, there, if you go to Cartesian problem, the coordinates, there's no problem. So you can, you can choose to have a funny coordinates, but in other coordinate systems, you, you uh, can have a, a, um, uh, a self-adjoint operator. Particle identity is not an idealization, and this issue is fundamental, I believe. Okay, uh, now, now I'm going to describe how to not even pretend that they're individual. The, uh, the, the way to do that is, well, uh, actually I'm not sure of this, but you, you first say, well, let's say the uh, spin wave function is even or odd. The spatial wave function needs to be even or odd also according to whether it's a boson or a fermion, and that gives you uh, immediately um, uh, symmetric or anti-symmetric function for the spatial. Now I'm, so now I'm talking about the spatial coordinates, which may be even or odd. The uh, coordinate space naively is r to the power of 6, namely six-dimensional Euclidean space. But it's not really that. The first thing to do is to say, r, whoops, 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 I got too enthusiastic. I think this, ah. The first thing to do is to say that R1 and R2 is the same point. This is a, a topological identification. R2, R1 is the same as R1, R2, and that becomes a, an equivalence relation that uh, uh, says they're equal to each other. And, but it's, it, that, but that, that's not all. You also apparently need to, re, to remove the so-called diagonal, namely, remove the points where R1 equals R2. For fermions, that's okay. Everyone would agree, I think. But for bosons, it's not clear, but they do it. And uh, why, why do they do it? Well, you can say that identical particles, it's meaningless to, to uh, say that what R1 is R2. Uh, by the way, this, this, these, I'm now repeating things that are discussed in uh, Laidlaw and DeWitt. I should mention uh, what I consider, well, maybe not criminal, but neglectful, that there's a paper by Linus and Marheim, Merheim, um, which is often quoted, which only says what, as far as I could tell, what Laidlaw and DeWitt said. And I think people should stop quoting them or quote Laidlaw and DeWitt also. Uh, but Laidlaw and DeWitt had the thing. And they, Laidlaw and DeWitt, already eliminated uh, the, the diagonal, I should mention there are two possible reasons. One is you can justify it in some sense, and the second is it works. So you eliminate the uh, diagonal, and you end up with a multiply connected space, as, because the space is not multiply connected unless you eliminate those, uh, those central points, because even having an equivalence relation doesn't give you a new uh, topology to the place to the space, but eliminating the one point in the center, it does give you a new topology and you can't uh, get rid of it. Uh, I think it's a little bit of, in practice, I think it's a little bit of each, 
I have to say that I myself thought about these things back in 1970, which I suppose dates me, but that's life. And um, I worried about this, and I missed, I missed the elimination of the diagonal, and that may way I missed the um, uh, elimination of, of the, the, the ability to make this thing multiply connected. And uh, I suspect, based on a remarks that uh, Cecile DeWitt made to me, I suspect it had something to do with the fact that Raoul Bott was visiting them, but that's not written anywhere. Maybe it is. I don't know who they who they thank in their in their acknowledgments, but uh, I, I think that this this way of making the space multiply connected was real is really clever, and it it works. As I said, you can you can justify it in words, but there are many people who have tried to justify it beyond that. And as far as I know, no one has really succeeded. In fact, there's a paper by a guy named Goyal, he's at Albany, who challenges this. I don't know what he replaces it by. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so here's the way, here's the identity, the space that I'm going to deal with. The space I have, I, I eliminate the, well, the space is uh, a, su a subset of R. Whoops. I get too enthusiastic. So the space is uh, a subset of R6, a subset, but it has an equivalence relation. Uh, it's R1 is not equal to R2, so it's this thing minus the, identi the point of coincidence, and it's modulo uh, the equivalence of these two points. So it's not quite, M is not quite the space that uh, uh, you originally thought, but it's, it's similar. Now, the first thing to do is, there is to get rid of the center of mass. So that, uh, because that behaves normally. And what you end up with is uh, just M, what I call it, tilde, and that's uh, R3 minus uh, zero, and this, this equi equivalence becomes an equivalence between R and R minus R. Okay, that's the first technical point. The second technical point is you need a set of coordinates for this space. And the set of coordinates is arbitrary to some extent. It's like a sphere. You, you can take the North Pole wherever you like. Well, you take the North Pole at the North, but you could take a different pole and uh, have a different set of coordinates. Y you all know the joke, don't you? That you, you, you hunt, you, go, you start out at your base camp, you go south a mile, then you go west a mile, you hunt the bear, and then you go north a mile back to your uh, original grounds. And the question is, what color is the bear? You know, the, the answer is white, because it has to be, uh, anyway. All right, so, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, so this, this point, so now I'm going to particular, pick a particular coordinate system for this thing, just as we do for the bear, uh, or for the North Pole, and the uh, coordinate system is, uh, basically it's orthogonal to the z axis, that's why I call it m sub z, it's all points for which z is either equal to zero, or z is equal to zero and y is positive, or z and y are both zero and x is positive. That's the space that we're going to talk about. And uh, on that space, we're going to do some calculations. Um, the main thing is that the fundamental homotopy group is z2. And uh, that's for dimension greater than two. For dimension equal to two is another very interesting question. It has to do with any ons. And I'm not going to talk about any ons at all, but maybe some of you are interested in that. And that and the reason for any ons is that in for dimension two, the fundamental homotopy group is not Z2, but it's much more complicated. And it's, in fact, not abelian. Uh, this space is also uh, not orientable, but th that doesn't play any role in what we're going to be doing. Okay. Uh, now, now I'm going to write a propagator down there are a lot of integrals that I'm not going to tell you about, or I'm going to refer to them in, in, uh, in the side. But those integrals are all done and are a pain in the neck. But I would like to know what the derivative of the momentum is. That's the purpose. Uh, whoops. And I'm going to use the simple relation that says the ADT is minus the commutator of A with H, where A is going to be the momentum operator. And the way I'm going to do that is to take um, the x, the propagator, which is e to the minus i h t, subtract 1 and divide by t, 
and that will give me the, the minus IH. Anyway, so I have to, um, okay, I, I'm, uh, we'll later on we'll take a more conventional approach, but for now I would like to do it in, uh, as, as I've described it. So I have to say a little bit about what multiple connectedness is. Maybe some people already know this, probably most of you do, but I'll, I'll just review it. An example of multiple connectedness is the uh, idealized Arona Bohm experiment, where you have a solenoid that is outside the, uh, outside the space of interest, and you can wind yourself around it n times or n plus 1 times, and n and n plus 1 times are not deformable into each other. And that's the question of, of homotopy. Uh, now, for that, you need to give the propagator for the multiple connected space. And the answer to how to give a propagator is, is as follows. For a given initial point, there are many paths to the final point. So you have an initial point, and you have some multiply connected space. And these, these paths will fall into one group for each element, one, a group I'm using in a, in a loose sense, one collection of paths for each element of the uh, um, fundamental group of the homotopy space, for each kind of homotopy that there is. And uh, you can get partial propagators uh, from this, partial propagators to some point on what's known as the covering space. And then you add up all the points in the covering space with a phase. L let me give an example. Uh, this is an old example, but maybe some people here haven't seen it. And this would be a circle. A circle is multiply connected because you can, uh, if you go around twice, you go around three times, you can't uh, deform them into each other. They're, they're simply different. And uh, let's take the coordinate to be phi. There's, uh, um, there's only one. Uh, now, for the basic circle, one only defines phi in the range 0 to 2 pi, but the covering space, which in this case is the whole line, has, has many points, which is phi plus any mu integer multiple of uh, 2 pi. And uh, th those are the various points in the covering space. Then what you do is you, oh, here's my notation. The I is initial, F is final, N is the number of times that I have uh, F equals 2 pi. The propagator becomes uh, the propagator of a sing of single class of states, since it's a free particle, just becomes this thing, which is just a free particle propagator. And finally, you have to add them up with some phases. But then you say, OK, if I go around once, it has to be the same as if uh, it, it has to give me the same phase for each of those points. When you do that, you find that e to the i k n plus 1 minus e to the i k n must be equal to some delta, and that delta plays a role. That's, that's the uh, extension of that particular uh, propagator. Okay, the fundamental group is the addition of integers, and one immediately has that uh, the propagator, the phase for n k, k sub n is just equal to n times delta, which is the representation of the group, and that's what you end up with. Okay. Uh, by the way, I can be interrupted. Uh, it's, I mean, uh, these talks have been very sacred, but my, my talk can be interrupted. <laughs> okay, the propagator on m sub z. Now you need to know the propagator. The propagator is simple, since the space is only m2, is only z2, and the, uh, the propagator, therefore, has only two terms in it, one in which it goes be there's, uh, between R1 and R, R double prime and R prime, and one which goes between R double prime and R prime plus, and plus R prime. So there's one thing that goes to, uh, to, this, to, to something within the space and one thing which goes outside of it because the covering space is the whole, the whole thing, the whole of R3 minus the zero. And... Uh, the M that appears in this, you remember that G, I don't know, I didn't say what G is. Uh, yes, I did, actually. Uh, G is, is, is this. This is G. Since it's a free particle, this becomes G. And the M that we use is half the electron mass in it because it's a, the, uh, the, um, the uh, combined mass of the two particles. Okay, so that's the propagator, and uh, that's the, yeah, and the uh, H is the free Hamiltonian, so we just have to prop to order, to in order to find this out, we have to do this 
this complicated story. You take various integrals with psi of r, with p, and then uh, you divide by p, you do a lot of integrations. It's a big mess, but I hope you'll believe that I can do it. And uh, when you do all those messy integrals, including one for the time, I think that's, yeah, I, I don't have the time here, but the time is also a pain in the neck. You end up with, no, that's in the next slide. You end up with the uh, derivative with respect to time of p is this, as usual, but this becomes an integral over the, over the plane. It doesn't become an integral over the whole space, but just over the plane. And then the, okay, all right. That, so th this, I'm sure you won't remember this, but this is the result that we obtain, an integral over the plane of the derivative of phi times the gradient of psi minus phi times uh, z, the derivative of z and the derivative of the gradient of psi. Okay, that's, that's one expression. Now let me do it in a completely uh, conventional way. It's not completely conventional, but somewhat conventional. I have, uh, uh, I'm using, now this is the usual way of doing things. You work with uh, uh, L2 of R, and then it's either plus or minus. So that's this space that you uh, use for the, uh, after you get rid of the center of mass. Then you, um, a second way to look at the same problem is in terms of m sub z, and you have L2 of m sub z. So you have two different spaces. You have L2 of m z and L2 of R3, which is the, or L plus minus 2. This is the usual. This is the unusual. But now I'm going to map them into each other. And the mapping is rather simple. If I do this mapping, if I map v plus minus into L2 as follows, I just multiply it by v plus or minus, and I just, uh, for the, I just, on M2, on MZ, I just take psi of R. The more complicated one is the inverse, where I have to change it, I have to change both all, I hear, for the plus, if it's in Z positive, I do nothing. If it's in Z negative, I both subtract the, I change R to minus R, and I change uh, plus to minus, I may or may not change plus to minus, depending on whether I have V plus or minus. So this is a mapping back, and guess what? Um, in MZ, momentum takes its usual form, and I want to find out what it's equal to on LZ. And the answer is, uh, I, I need a new name for it, and I find that the momentum, the simple momentum on LZ, on L plus minus R3, is the sine of Z. Now remember, that depends on the coordinate, but uh, that's life. But finally, I can calculate uh, phi Q dot, that which is what I calculated before, and the answer is the same. This is a, an agreement with the early result I have that uh, this is an integral over the plane of uh, this derivative minus that derivative, which is identical. So both ways of doing it give you the same result. Okay. Um, now, now let me talk about problems. Is this an, a self-adjoint operator or not? the operator that I get for this, for this uh, object? And the answer is, in order to be a self-adjoint operator, I take this, this quantity minus its adjoint, and I see what the difference is. And the difference is an integral across along the plane. Now, does that integral matter or not? For, uh, right, let's look at L2 of minus R. So now I'm looking at odd functions on R. So QZ, I claim, is not self-adjoint. Well, it's almost self-adjoint, but it's not. Why is it not self-adjoint? To be Hermitian, you need to have the right-hand side of this thing vanish. In order to be, which is fine, because if, uh, for odd functions, both of these have to vanish, and everybody's happy. But the adjoint of that quantity, the doma its domain, is much larger. It will contain functions that do not vanish, so Q is not self-adjoint. Uh, now, how about if L2 is positive, it's even worse. There's no reason for phi or psi, psi or phi, to vanish at all, and uh, it's not even Hermitian. So Mr. Van Neumann is wrong. I mean, there's simply no, there's no operator that corresponds to it. Uh, now, let's talk about, now I would like to verify that this makes sense. So 
This is just a verification step, but let me do it anyway. The, uh, in terms of Fourier components, and, I, and now I'm putting in time, pro time because uh, everybody's free, I have that psi is equal to some integral over Fourier components of e to the minus i k t. And uh, after, you, okay, you have to fool around a little bit and you end up looking at delta q, which is the integral of q dot, and you have to do, the, uh, this is where I, uh, this integral is rather singular, but it turns out that it's equal to a delta function of u minus v, u plus v divided by the absolute value of u. And after a certain amount of playing around, you end up with delta q is equal to that, which makes a lot of sense. Why? Because uh, you take into account the sine function, and you end up with delta q equal to four times the average value of q, uh, of k rather, which makes sense since you have two particles. Each one has reversed its position. You have to think a little bit outside the box in this case. The uh, particles are coming in. They go out. I'm integrating from minus infinity to plus infinity in time. They come in. They go out. Each one has lost in momentum 2k, and therefore the average is uh, 4k. Uh, finally, um, okay, uh, let me give you a kind of solution to this business. Uh, which is not really a solution, but it's, uh, it uh, makes you happy, if you like. Uh, let's, let's look at Q for two different functions. So I'm going to generalize it to a, a different concept. And I can show that the bad part of Q0, of the derivative, leaves us with the following object, that delta Q is just the uh, derivative of the, the square root of the derivative, which is exactly right. And uh, that, that's, that's one piece of good news. It's a self-adjoint operator. And finally, uh, so the message of this thing is stick to asymptotic measurements, and you're OK. Uh, finally, um, OK, so let me summarize, but I'm, I'm th there's another point to be made. Uh, there's a physical quantity relative momentum of two identical particles that's represented by a point on the projective plane. Uh, the quantity that's associated with it is perfectly well defined, but it's not self-adjoint. And uh, what is self-adjoint is the asymptotic quantities. Now, this is a paper that I don't understand by Landau and Parles. It starts off and talks about philosophy and all kinds of stuff, but they end up, they end up claiming that for interacting particles, measures, uh, um, measurements are impossible. And I have to, well, we have different reasons, or I don't know what their reasons are, to tell you the truth, because I c didn't succeed in reading their entire article. But, uh, wi which doesn't, th that's my fault, not theirs. <laughs> uh, and um, they, they said, but for, uh, I think it's different reasons, they had that it's impossible also, and we would say that uh, um, if you look at the time integral, everything is, is okay, if you go from minus infinity to plus infinity, but if you look at any finite time, then it's not self-adjoint. That's, that's the talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So we have a lot of time for questions and discussion. So I know you've thought about spin, but how does it fit? <laughs> 